everybody. Let's try it again. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> um, I can find a chord for this. Can get some sound and light out of this machine. Just do a quick uh, sound check. Let's see my stuff come up on your screen. Good, that works. Apologizing for breaking the space with, uh, that Glenn just created. Um, <clears throat> so the title of my presentation was Whole Body Photobiomodulation for Fibromyalgia and Other Pain Syndromes. Um, who here has heard of photobiomodulation? I can't see any of you. <laughs> so I have no idea. Are there any hands up? <laughs> OK. Is that, is that like half of you or 10%? Couldn't hear that. Uh, and um, uh, ooh, uh, who here has been treated with it? I have no idea what you're doing. <laughs> I can see a bit if I do that. OK. And uh, what else did I say? Um, anybody here treated somebody else with it? You have to wave your hands a bit, yes, so I can see the movement. That helps. Uh, who here has never heard of it? <laughs> it's hard to tell. It might be half of you. I'm not sure. OK, right. So my plan for you is to say, what is photobiomodulation? How does it work? Something about its medical uses, specifically fibromyalgia uh, and other health applications. Uh, when you do medical presentations, you have to do disclosure. So I am founder CEO of Thor. Uh, I'm a co-founder and an investor in another photobiomodulation company called Lumathera. So that means I'm extremely biased. And you can't believe anything I'm about to tell you. I started life as an engineer designing radio stations. I'm not a scientist or a doctor, so you can't trust me, and I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but, I, but I have been doing this a long time, since 1987. Uh, 35 years in this field, I've co-authored 27 academic papers on this subject, six of them with Harvard Medical School, co-authored four academic books. My expertise is on dose and beam parameters. I'm an expert reviewer for the journals that publish most of the work in this field. I'm a co-chair of the Biomedical Optics Society Conference on Photobiomodulation Mechanisms, and I've joined a couple of other interesting clubs. Uh, a lot of our collaborators are here on the screen here, many of them from Harvard Medical School, Harvard School of Public Health, working on noise-induced hearing loss, at Brigham Women's Hospital, treating children who are going through bone marrow transplants for cancer. They get nasty side effects. I'll say more about that later on. Uh, traumatic brain injury at MGH, Massachusetts General Hospital, uh, doing experiments on mice and rats, looking on the mechanism of action, the dose response. The VA, we are already treating patients, and so on. I've got a small amount of time, so I can't go through all of these. Lots going on in our National Health Service in the UK, which, by the way, explains my speech impediment. It's called English. <laughs> anyway, so we have collaborating with uh, 60 different academic institutions around the world, uh, most recently lots of NHS, uh, Stanford University School of Medicine working on age-related uh, hearing loss at the moment, among many. Fibromyalgia, what is, it, what is it? You probably know. Fibromyalgia is the pit, isn't it? Uh, if you know anybody's got it, they've got pain, inflammation, tenderness, they're having sleep problems as well, so pain in joints, inflammation leading to fatigue, uh, systemic inflammation, tenderness in muscles, sleep problems, they get brain fog as well. My wife, who's an osteopath, says it's very similar to long COVID, she says. Okay, that's fibromyalgia. What is photobiomodulation? It's something that your grandparents used to watch on TV in a TV show called Star Trek. On Star Trek, when somebody was injured, they'd get taken to the sick bay and the doctor would get out a laser beam and would aim the laser at the injury and the injury would heal instantly. So we make those. Any questions? <laughs> okay, it's not as fast as on TV, but get the idea. We shine light on people, and they heal more quickly. Live long and prosper. And if you're old enough, you know that voice. It's Mr. Spock. And if you use photobiomodulation, you will lo live longer and prosper. There you go. Anyway, um, unfortunately, this therapy's had a lot of different names over the years. Too many to mention, but over 100 different names in this therapy used to be called mostly low-level laser therapy on the internet. If you know what PubMed is, the government database for medicine, low-level laser therapy was the leading term. It is now photobiomodulation. Photo means light, bio means life, 
Modulation means we can stimulate and we can inhibit. We can slow some things down, and already it's been reduced to PBM or PBM therapy, or sometimes PBMT. So we're going to call it PBM from now on. Oh, got stuck there. Right. What is it? It's the application of monochromatic light, which means light of one color. And if we have light at the right color, or as we prefer to say, the right wavelength, if we have light at the right wavelength, and if the light is at the right intensity, and if we aim it in the right place for the right amount of time, we increase the speed and quality of tissue repair. We can reduce inflammation and edema, and we can induce an analgesic effect. Most of the uh, published clinical evidence is on musculoskeletal pain, so sprains and strains and creaky joints, but there's also good evidence for, for its effects on neuropathic pain, like shingles and post-hepatic neuralgia, hard-to-heal wounds like venous ulcers and diabetic foot ulcers, uh, breast cancer-related lymphedema, fibromyalgia is on the list, chronic regional pain syndrome, and also it has some effects and useful benefits for healthy people as well. Uh, it's used like this. It's applied to the body in this manner with handheld uh, devices in and around the oral cavity. If you're a dentist, uh, non-healing wounds being treated here, uh, cancer patients being treated for very common to have oral complications, one of which is called oral mucositis. You can hear a bit more in a minute about that and veterinarians are using it as well. Uh, and of course, we now have this whole body treatment system uh, where you can treat the whole body, and that sort of kind of looks like that when you're using it. Um, this is not a heat therapy. People assume lasers and the red and near-infrared light must mean something to do with heat. No, the effect from this treatment is more like photosynthesis in plants, because humans and animals will photosynthesize. This is something you know already. You know when you go out in the sun, you change color. It's a form of photosynthesis. And you know that we use sunlight to help synthesize vitamin D. And you might know they use blue light tr uh, therapies on prematurely born babies to reduce neonatal jaundice, another form of photosynthesis. Uh, doctors or dermatologists specifically will use ultraviolet light to treat psoriasis and vitiligo. So <clears throat> nobody should be surprised if light has other effects on the body. Now, normally people think of lasers and medicine as being used for cutting and ablating and cauterizing tissue. Well, not all lasers are dangerous. If you're old enough, you may have seen this movie, Goldfinger with James Bond. Um, so not all lasers are dangerous. That's because there's different classes of lasers. There are the lasers used in supermarkets or my lecture pointer here. Nobody gets hurt with this thing. Lasers are not necessarily dangerous. The dangerous ones you're thinking about in medicine are the class four lasers. These are the ones that have a thermal effect. We use class three B lasers. They have no harmful effects on skin or clothing, but they are potentially hazardous to the eye. So you, your patients, and the observers would wear laser safety glasses. We also use light emitting diodes, LEDs. They've got some similar qualities to lasers. We don't have time to discuss today. Um, but uh, we use those, and you don't need all the safety glasses, but they have the same effect. We'll very briefly touch on the history. It starts with Albert Einstein, seems to end up with me. Great slide. My mum would have been proud. Uh, Einstein came up with a theory about uh, light amplification by the stimulated emission of radiation, LASER laser. This guy wants to actually made the first working laser in 1960. This guy wants to find out, does it cause cancer? He does an experiment on mice. He, shaves, he uh, takes a group of mice. He shaves the hair from their bodies. He divides them into two groups, puts a low-intensity laser beam on one group and not the other to see if the treatment group developed cancer, and they didn't. And to his surprise, the hair grew back more quickly on the treatment group compared with the untreated group. And so that's how he discovered photobiomodulation. Over here in the United States, things really didn't lift off until NASA got involved over here. Uh, and that, by the way, is my best joke of the day. Things didn't lift off until NASA got involved. Okay, huh. You have to be old enough to know these things, because, I mean, we've got SpaceX and Blue Origin and uh, the, the uh, galactic thing that uh, Richard Branson does and NASA. I mean, there's a rocket going up every day now. It's like, anyway... Um, yes, NASA wanted to find that um, we're planning manned missions to Mars. The problem for astronauts on a long space flight is they lose bone density, they have muscle wasting, if they cut themselves shaving, they don't heal. They wanted to find out if there was something, you know, if this magical light, photobiomodulation, would help the health and longevity of astronauts. Now, on a trip to Mars, they haven't been to Mars yet, so we don't know, but they did some interesting research on the field. But subsequently, I suppose the field really took off when... Um, <clears throat> I suppose around like 2006, 
the journal Nature published an editorial on the mechanism of action, the journal Pain from the International Association for the Study of Pain uh, on, on the treatment of photobiomodulation for neck pain. Then the World Health Organization, their bone and joint task force start recommending it for neck pain. The Lancet, the world's leading journal for breakthrough medicine, uh, started uh, recommending it for neck pain. American Physical Therapy Association, Achilles Tendinopathies, International Association for Study of Pain, strong evidence in their systematic reviews for myofascial pain syndrome, frozen shoulder, tennis elbow, lymphedema, uh, low back pain. American College of uh, Physicians guidelines now say non-invasive, uh, recommended as a non-invasive treatment for acute, subacute, and chronic low back pain, a strong recommendation. Blue Cross Blue Shield are now saying it's medically necessary. In the UK, National Institute for Health and Care Excellence guidelines now recommend photobiomodulation for cancer patients at risk of developing oral mucositis, and so on. Eventually, we end up down here. J JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, says it's an option. Not a strong statement, but it's a start. I mean, it's a hugely influential journal uh, a low, for low back pain lasting more than 12 weeks. So now for the field, there's over 1,000 randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials on humans published in peer-reviewed medical journals. More than 4,000 lab studies, 660 papers, academic papers published last year on the subject, 8,500 academic papers in total. For our own products, 34 million treatments have been uh, uh, performed to date. And yet nobody's heard of it, or well, most of you haven't heard of it. Anyway, state of the art is the strong evidence is muscle and joint pain, oral mucositis, I mentioned, the cancer therapy side effect, dry age related macular degeneration, the leading cause of blindness in this country, improving strength, endurance, and recovery in athletes, and other things. I've kind of mentioned some of those already. Uh, but we're going to move on due to time. So, the moderate levels of evidence just means small clinical trials, not many of them. Uh, experimental means mostly just case series papers. Uh, anecdotal means not even that, just anecdotal. How can one medicine treat so many different conditions? You know, you should never believe anything that appears to do everything. Uh, well, it doesn't do everything. Uh, it does one thing. It has a profound effect on mitochondria. You may know that mitochondria are often, if you learned about, a bit of biology at school, they were often called the powerhouse of the cell. Uh, they take up glucose and oxygen and make cellular energy is probably what you were taught. Okay, so mitochondria is a cartoon picture of one. You have hundreds and thousands of these in every single cell of your body. Uh, and when we're sick and when we're injured and when we're stressed, and just gradually as we get old, our cells tend to be low on energy, ATP. They tend to be high in oxidative stress, which is a bad state for your cells to be in. They're making too many reactive oxygen species, uh, free radicals if you like. Uh, that lead to oxidative stress and the over, overstimulated gene trans transcription factor called NF kappa B. This is as nerdy as it gets, and this is going to get easier from here. The master switch for inflammation in every cell of the body, for all those inflammatory cytokines we heard about with COVID, for example, being the inflammation, cell death, necrosis, degenerative diseases, and generally accelerating the aging process, which is why you want antioxidants in your diet, for example. But when we put light into patients, we can put it exactly where the injury is. We put light in, it gets absorbed in mitochondria, and the state of the cells changes to one where it makes more energy and less oxidative stress. And we start to, I'm going to call it the master switch for tissue repair. We get these regenerative effects. So if you've done any biology or a doctor, anybody out there, these are anti-inflammatory mechanisms you might be familiar with, get turned on, regenerative mechanisms if you've done enough biology, uh, but leading to tissue repair and tissue survival. And I love what uh, Glenn was saying earlier, and it reminded me that photobiomodulation basically leads to help cell homeostasis, or a state of peace, as he was saying, if you want me to put it in the terms of this conference. That has some interesting downstream effects, which I'm not going to talk about. Uh, but this is basically what happens next after you put light in. That leads to faster tissue repair, less edema, less inflammation, and less pain. There is a dose response. If you don't have enough intensity, there's no effect. You put a bit more light in, you get positive effects on inflammation and repair. Too much, you tend to lose it, and you can actually slow things down if you want to. So we try to keep people inside this therapeutic window. So medical use of it, it's regenerative is one of its features. Oral mucositis, uh, there's over 60 randomized placebo-controlled clinical trials with this horrible side effect of chemotherapy and radiotherapy. In this study here, the five grades of oral mucositis in these cancer patients who are going through chemotherapy uh, here, 
This is grade four oral mucositis in the placebo group. You can see that these are the placebo group get most of the grade four. These patients cannot drink or eat or swallow solid food. Grade three patients can drink liquid, but they can't eat solid food there. And you'll notice that the dark bars, which are the active photobiomodulation group, only one patient get, is in grade four with, where they can't eat or drink. Everybody else has got mouth soreness, just erythema in the mouth, or nothing at all. So PBM has moved these patients from the severe end of being able to eat or drink down to this end of the scale, which is low grades of pain, inflammation, or uh, just visual erythema, or nothing at all. It's highly anti-inflammatory, and it's regenerative. This is, an, uh, a, a, the, um, this is called neurosensory recovery after injury to the inferior alveolar nerve. That's the nerve that runs down the side of the inside of your jaw, your mandible. If the dentist pulls your, uh, your third molar out through the wisdom extraction, there's sometimes the roots of the tooth get caught up in the nerve, they pull the tooth, the nerve snaps, and if it doesn't heal by itself within a year, you're left with a numb feeling around the border of your tongue, around the, your lip and chin, around here, for the rest of your life. You know what it's like after injection, you can't drink or anything, you dribble, that kind of thing. You're stuck there for the rest of your life. These patients have had it for more than a year, they've got, um, this is my pointer there, down the bottom there, they're getting a low score on the brush stroke directional discrimination test, dentist closes their eyes, the patient closes their eyes, the dentist does a test, they can't feel anything, got a very low score, a course of treatment, photobiomodulation, three times a week for seven weeks, 20 treatments in all, you get recovery of the nerves. Nothing in medicine does this, apart from photobiomodulation. If you can see four kids in my kitchen, you do not have dry, age-related macular degeneration, the leading cause of blindness in this country. You may know people who have injections for it. They have the wet form. That's 10% of AMD patients. 90% are untreatable. And basically, um, it goes like this. You lose central vision, and you get a distortion in your vision. You lose contrast sensitivity. Your world goes black and white. You develop these blind spots called geographic atrophy, which get worse, until you can't read, you can't drive, you can't shop, you can't enjoy TV. You lose independent living. With the treatment to a, my co-founder in this business, Disclosure, they're an investor in the company. Uh, we just finished 18 randomized controlled clinical trials across the world. It's all in the hands of the FDA now, and we expect that early next year there will, the product will be released and, um, for treatment. I'll just show you one set of data. Patients here, are, are, from their baseline, have an improvement on the uh, Snellen chart, you know, the chart where the, you get the ophthalmologist, where the letters get smaller. You have this increase in visual acuity. Five letters effectively means you can read one line further down the chart. And for most people, that means the difference between losing your driving license or not, for example. And that uh, they, get a, they get a course of treatment in month one, uh, and then uh, uh, we measure them three months later, and they Improvement seems to be continuing, even though we stopped treatment. If you stop for too long, the, treat the benefits disappear, but you give them another course of treatment, they come back again. If we stop the treatment again, it goes away again, and so on. So degenerative diseases are not curable, but we can get rid of the symptoms of dry AMD, and this is true for all degenerative diseases with this technology. You treat it. If it's degenerative, like your knees, your osteoarthritis, your brain with your Alzheimer's, or your eyes with the disease, it always comes back, so you need more treatment. If you have an acute traumatic injury, you know, like a sports injury or something, or surgery, uh, and you treat it and you heal it, it's healed for life. So get that bit handled. It's anti-inflammatory. Here's an experiment done on uh, athletes. They've got Achilles tendinopathies. They do something called a microdialysis measurement for PGE2 concentrations. That's an inflammatory marker. So you stick it in the Achilles tendon there, and then they get a treat. Oh, I've missed, a, I've missed the graph off. But you know the answer. We do active treatment group to a placebo group, uh, and you treat their Achilles tendon. The inflammation goes down in the treatment group and not in the, uh, uh, not in the placebo group. Sorry, I missed the, uh, the graph off of that. It's analgesic. post hepatic neuralgia is one of the worst kinds of pain that anybody can get. Uh, people can't uh, lie down. They can't wear shirts. Uh, they can't bear to be touched. It drives people to suicide. It's that kind of pain, typically around the thorax here. Um, so in this study here, just a small study, 20 patients have PHN for 
a mean duration of two and a half years, that's six to eight years. Get only one treatment a week. I thought this wasn't going to work. One treatment a week in the treatment group, the pain comes down on the pain score. It doesn't happen in the placebo group. It's a crossover trial. That means this group B get the active treatment. This group go on to, group, uh, go on to a placebo. Now, the pain doesn't come back, and it stays away. Uh, look, 95% of patients discontinued all medication for a month. 5% had a reduced dosage, and at six-month follow-up, 80% of patients have maintained their pain reduction. Nothing else does this. Um, now, this is the use of opioids by ca uh, cancer patients uh, having oral mucositis. There is a 68, you can't see my dot really, but 68% reduction in the use of opioids, and this has been repeated multiple times. Like I said, there's, there's um, over 1,000 randomized controlled clinical trials. Post-operative pain, I know of three off the top of my head, which, you, which show approximately the same 68, 70% reduction in the use of opioids if they have this treatment after surgery. Myofascial pain, these are the tender points you get on your body, you know, somebody massages your neck and says, oh, you've got knots in your shoulders, let me press on that, or something like that. A systematic review published in The Lancet, the world's leading journal for breakthrough medicine, uh, say that those myofascial trigger points in your neck that basically stop people from being able to turn their heads, if anybody who has a problem like this and can't fully rotate and uh, extend and, uh, their head, their head uh, we should treat you later on. It, PBM works well for reducing those points. It improves sleep. Uh, Chinese People Liberation Army study here, lying under a red LED lamp, not fully clothed. They would normally be in their underwear, uh, get a treatment every night. And what happens? They have an improvement in serum melatonin, so the melatonin levels in their blood. It doesn't happen in the placebo group. And they have a reduction uh, in the Pittsburgh Quality Sleep Index. That measures the negative aspects of sleep, like insomnia, for example. Goes down in the photobiomodulation group. It doesn't go down in the placebo group. Uh, and they also do some exercise tests. They uh, have to see how far they can run in 12 minutes. And they run further than the control group does. So they, they, rather, they have an improvement in that too. Fatigue, we do experiments on people where we put them on a Biodex machine, that do how much exercise they can do, uh, repetitions on this machine, which measures the amount of exercise they do. Then they either get cryotherapy or they get photobiomodulation or they ice followed by PBM or PBM followed by ice or placebo. So there's four goots and a placebo. And they do blood tests before uh, and afterwards at uh, one hour one day, two days, and three days afterwards. Uh, and, they do, and they also do strength tests, and they do pain tests. And photobiomodulation after that exercise, blood test for creatine kinase, a marker for muscle damage here, shows that it's down here, at the, and the red line at the bottom here, compared with all the other groups. Photobiomodulation of, uh, reduces delayed onset muscle soreness, so there's less pain means that all the groups that had photobiomodulation got in less pain compared with cryotherapy or placebo treatments down there. Uh, maximum voluntary capacity, strength in newton meters. These people are back to full strength the next day, the day after, and the day after that. It doesn't happen with ice therapy or cryotherapy or placebo. Um, we were first uh, introduced to Novathor This is the at Olympics the at Rio. 2016 Olympic trials. Um, Alberto Salazar had a unit at his house he offered uh, Justin the ability to use the Novathor bed that he personally had to help him get through the rounds. And it was crunch time, and I'm running with an ace bandage on. And Dennis comes to me, and he says, look, you know, we're going to go over here, we're going to try this Novathor out. And I literally did it maybe the day before, because sometimes athletes are really skeptical about doing things the day of their meet, and they want to break routine. And I remember getting off the bed, and I felt so rejuvenated. I just felt like my cells were just popping like popcorn. And I told Dennis, like, all right, we got to go over there before, <laughs> before the finals of the 200. So we went there the day of the race. So the next day we went there again. I got a uh, Novathor treatment, and I felt great. I went out there. The odds were against me. I was running in lane eight, so I was running blind. And I, I was still up in the air about this, this nagging injury I had. And I went out there and ran one of the fastest times in the world at that point in time to make the Olympic team. The difference between him one day to the next day using the Novathor bed was like night and day. And we knew he had a really big race, and his competitor, which was a Nike athlete too, was also using the bed. 
Um, so we kind of had a little, hey, you can't get it better than I can kind of thing. And uh, Justin ended up squeezing them out by a couple of hundredth of a second to make the Olympic team and win the Olympic trials. So at that point, we were sold on Novathor. Uh, we'll stop that there. Um, let's jump to the fibromyalgia. So basically, I'm building up to the story with fibromyalgia being the pits, the pain, inflammation, tenderness, and sleep issues. Um, fibromyalgia, we did a randomized controlled clinical trial on 42 patients. Uh, no benefit in the first two weeks of any significance, but by about week four, they're using it three times a week for four weeks, you begin to see the pain levels coming down in the scale, and then you stop treatment, and it continues to get better. And this is a consistent thing we find with this. Once you've started people healing, treatment doesn't just take away pain. It actually helps you heal. And once you stop using it, you've still got momentum to that. And so the scores continue to get better uh, over time. Quality of life goes up here uh, over the same periods of time. If you're a statistician out there, you'll know what a Cohen's D is and a p-value is. 0 0.05 is good. 0 0.01 is better. 0 0.001 is extraordinary. Uh, Cohen's D, anything better than 0.8 is good. 2.5 nearly is enormous. It is a very strong, very effective treatment. Leisure activity, not much after two weeks, and then at four weeks, you can see it jumps up. People have more confidence to go out and use their bodies. I'm aware that I'm up against my time limit then. I'm just going to say there is one more thing. I'm just going to show you how it actually reduces inflammation and what it does for the longevity of the brain and the health span. But the one more thing we actually do is to make something that actually treats your head as well. Uh, I've now run out of time, so I'm going to thank you all for coming. And uh, you may now clap your hands. Wow, there's another crowd there.